Good morning, Willem. So nice to see you again. Um, thank you for making time for this conversation. Um, I actually thought this morning, it's pretty much to the day that we first met um, just down the road from here in a little cafe, um, two weeks after my daughter was born, three years ago. Um, so right. it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You were on, on a holiday in Mallorca. Um, yeah. So the this, this series is, is a series of conversations I'm having with people that I see in the larger field of what, what I call the regeneration rising, um, a global response to the converging crises, um, but also to the, the potential that we now have to say, we clearly know that exponential growth on a finite planet is impossible. Um, we clearly see the impact of the system that no longer um, will give our children and children's children a livable future on this planet. And we see that everywhere people are um, responding to this. And then for, for me, this is, this is a global movement that goes beyond um, the practice of regenerative development. It's, it's a whole network of organizations. Some of them have been around for 50 years. Some of them have been set up in the last five, 10 years that are now beginning to um, create a concerted response and um so what i normally invite people to do my guests on the show is, is to start with their personal story a little bit to to um tell how they got into what they're doing um so i would like love to hear rather than me introducing you and saying you well I, there's all these wonderful things of you you've studied biology you studied um tropical ecology agriculture and environmental science but it's always better to have the story from the person, him or herself. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. No, it's uh, thank you very much for for joining. Um, uh, it's it's an honor to to talk to you and to yeah to to know you. It's, it's great to to see what you are doing and and how that that feeds very much into what what I'm doing and what a lot of people are trying to establish now. Um, yeah, my personal story is uh, always um, starts when you wonder as a kid. Uh, some about something and that happened with me as well uh, and I hope with a lot of other kids it's still uh, you know we they still have the opportunity to 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 get these what I call magic moments in their life um, and for me it was when I was very young uh, already uh, nature although I was raised in Amsterdam as an Amsterdam city kid uh, nature was always around the corner and for me all those small creepy animals that you could find you know in small bushes in the city um, where where small miracles and uh, that's where it all started I think um, because I brought all those animals back back home put them in kind of terraria uh, to to observe them although my mom and dad were you know sometimes a bit uh, looking what, what is he doing uh, and that was and I think that period um, formed framed me uh, and later on uh, that brought me to yeah to study biology and to uh, to understand biodiversity and, and and the diversity of species and how ecology is working and these kind of things um and i've yeah i've had experiences in in when when i was young as a kid uh, when these magical moments were very powerful sometimes that you had the feeling that an animal was speaking to you or a tree and and maybe this sounds a bit a little bit weird but that that gives you the feeling of unity of whole wholeness and i think that, that wholeness feeling and experience never I, I kept it in a way i was able to to maintain it also when i grew up uh, in the puberty times and later on which is really not easy because i'm i'm like going through at the university of amsterdam a degree in biology and and, and studying uh, mm -hmm. environmental science at the time um mm -hmm. i mean that must have been when when did you do your, your degree it was in the 80s uh, i finished my studies in 87 1987 uh, science was still pretty reductionist like i mean when i did yeah. biology at edinburgh in in the early 90s um i still remember some of the professors calling ecology the weird science uh, not proper science uh, yeah uh, um, yeah and of course uh, yeah you're so You're so right. I studied, of course, I studied ecology and tropical ecology, vegetation science, uh, and I was focused on not on animals but on, on on flora, fauna, flora, sorry, and vegetation science. And yes, that was of course reductionist. I mean, it was all 
part of the the, the big you know understanding and and and, and do uh, you know it was very much uh, it's it, it it is still is i think a very much a scientific um beta uh science uh which is good but yeah on the other hand i was able to go to nature mm -hmm. and i was able to stay in nature I, I was doing these researches and and you know all the things that were needed but still i was able to be there in the most wonderful places and because i i, I you know as soon as i could 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 take a sabbatical within my study period which i did at that time it was still possible so i took off a year and went to India and Sri Lanka and you know because I wanted to go to the tropics so I bought the, the, the cheapest tickets I could find at that time it was to Colombo and um, yeah and the new world opened up for me and um, and I, then I realized that you know I need to go to I need to work and, and understand tropical ecosystems because they were the most diverse I could ever see and have found in my life I know that in advance but I didn't you know you need to experience it and I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I was able to to, um, to to do the scientific part while maintaining the the miracle, the wonder part, Wonderful. and and, uh, and and keep that because that was the real driver within myself to understand the scientific part and and, and bringing those two together uh, uh, because science did not always have an answer or why a tree could speak to you, for instance, or whatever. You know, it's not speaking. It's more you know you could you could feel. Uh, it's, it's about the feeling of, of, of the, the yeah the healing power of nature on the other hand while the scientific background is super important as well uh, to understand how ecosystems work what species to interact with, with all kinds of species how does the colonization process of revegetation works after uh, you know a land has been cleared all these things are uh, I was very anxious to know, and still am very anxious to understand how that works. So science is, 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 a, is a very much a part of myself, ecological science, agro-science, because I, I was very much interested in, in that world, you know, where agro and nature uh, was facing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that was actually the, 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 the basis of my studies. Um, and yeah, the real old growth forest and nature, the virgin places, that could re-energize people. Uh, I, I find it fascinating, like I, because it so resonates with my story of, of like, I basically studied biology and um, worked on marine mammal ethology, behavioral science of marine mammals, and just got frustrated by um, seeing and sensing so much complexity and then having to keep it to what I could Put into statistically significant boxes and ha add a p-value to and anything else was anthropocentrism anthropomorphism and whatever they would would call it um projection and and there was no way of including this qualitative experience um in the scientific discourse and so that, that's why i initially left science and then did a master's in holistic science because when i saw that there was this place at schumacher college uh, that this, this new course that was actually addressing all the things that had made me go away from science um it, uh, it I, I immediately signed up for it but it, it's i think it, it's it's a rare but well maybe not that rare maybe there's a lot of biologists and life scientists who have to hold this slight um well this is the schizophrenia that that in what some circles where you where you talk hard science you mm -hmm. you, you would get ostracized if you start talking about a tree uh talking to you in yeah the, oh but i never i never talked about that yeah i never talked about it you know it was my world and yeah. um but i observed it and i felt it and you know i think the I think yeah. When I was young, um, you know, I, I I had the I don't know what happened, but at a certain moment, I I, I was told by by an animal that 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 uh, actually when I I yeah I can briefly explain. I remember that I was a kid, I was very young and uh, eight years old, and was walking in in front. And I think it was in Italy with my with, with my father, and there were some Italians standing around it. A snake that they were trying to kill and I, you know, for me it was you know a wonder wow a snake beautiful and i was looking in the eyes you know, of that snake and that snake uh, was still not dead it was laying there you know it was a, you know just a grass snake you know not a very anonymous animal not at all and uh, and i asked in myself you know what are they doing to you 
And immediately the answer of that snake came back and they said, they are killing themselves. And at that moment, it, that was so powerful. I really, I suddenly felt the unity in myself. You know, I'm the snake, the snake is me. Those Italian people are the snake as well. We are all the same, but they don't know. Um, because actually they didn't know what they were doing. And if you feel such a, and I have um, some other experiences in this, this way later on as well. And, 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 and if you feel that and you can nurture that and keep it, Mm -hmm. And, you know, science is every is, is an additional great opportunity to learn more about system, about whole, whole about, you know, about all the scientific things of biology. And I was, you know, consuming that all and trying to get more and more and understand the reading all the books and getting more understanding of all the plants and the species. And I wanted to know all the you know, animal species of the world and with their letter names and blah, blah, all that stuff. Because I, because it didn't. I, I did it, 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 yeah, it was kind of a separate part, mm -hmm. while this other secret or, or unity feeling was there, and actually it was so powerful, it could not move, it, it, couldn't, it, it was impossible to get it away, and I, I was trying to go to places where I could nurture both parts, the, the scientific part with the species and so on, and understanding landscapes, reading landscapes, understanding how that was working, the interaction between organic and, on, and, or, and anorganic material, while also going to those places where I could find, for instance, indigenous people who could tell me about that other world and nurture me and in that part. And that was, and, and, and that those two parts were, are part of myself. And that's maybe why I'm in my career, I'm incre uh, increasingly being able to build bridges between those two parts. Also, uh, whether it's with business or, 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 or with scientific science people because i can speak their language and with you know the the other world that is basically all the same uh, uh, but i i hope i can explain it you know, i do explain it uh, sufficient sufficiently enough that's uh, wonderful yeah. i mean it, i hear a real kind of a naturalist speaking in the tradition of um humboldt and heckel and goethe um who were seeing the power of science, but also holding that larger holistic perspective of how life is, is one planetary interconnected process and, and we're, we're not yes. separate from each other. Um, but in, in, your, in your career, you, you then, um, I wanted to actually get to this bridge building that you just um, yeah. named as well, because that's what I've observed when I look at what, what you've been doing, um, fortunately, somebody drilling out there, um, that you've really, become a master in weaving between uh, the, the different sectors that normally don't talk to each other. And you've, you've brought that into your work with the, I mean, the, the work with the IUCN, how did you move from being a research ecologist into um, conservation and even some, some tourism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, when I finished my studies as a tropical ecologist at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, it was, of course, impossible to find a job. Mm -hmm. First of all, no one uh, was, you know, there was no internet, so you couldn't apply for international jobs very easily because, they were, you know, you need to look in all kinds of magazines to find those jobs. The second thing was, you know, ecology was just not, the, and it was not a topic. Uh, you know, everyone was working uh, to find a job in, in the economic uh, uh, powers uh, and world of making a business and, and public serving and so on. And, and tropical ecology for a Dutch person was even more difficult. So, um, uh, and as I was used to go out and wanted to do expeditions and go to those beautiful places in the world, um, I found, I, I, I teamed up with some other biologists, unemployed biologists, and we decided to set up a company in ecotourism so that we could travel towards all those places with our knowledge and prepare that uh, while others were paying for it because we brought some tourists with us. And that's ended up in a quite successful company. Uh, it's probably the, the most successful Dutch company in ecotourism, in international ecotourism. It's one of the largest in Europe, I think, uh, called SNP, Natuurreisen. And that company still exists. Uh, and uh, I was there for eight years, almost nine years, and I developed the Latin America program uh, in you know many beautiful places like Venezuela, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru, these kind of places. 
and was able to organize expeditions, write small booklets and leaflets and, and, and on all, every place. So every, for each destination, we, we published a booklet of like 100 pages on, 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 what, on the natural uh, phenomena we were going to see. Yeah. And uh, without internet, so we needed to look into and buy books and, you know, so I went to bookstores in Colombia and Peru and, and Costa Rica to find those books, shelves, uh, you know, all kinds of books and trying to make something out of it uh, at that time. And um, yeah, so I learned, I, I think I learned two things there, Bus what business means, how to earn your money uh, and how to develop programs and manage them, but also how to manage people and groups and with them, because I was also their tour guide. Uh, so if you go with let's say 30 or 25 people into the jungle for a month or three weeks that and you are the leader and you are 28 and they are like 30 40 or 50 or 60 then it is a challenge to to keep them all together and keep them safe out and get them safe out of that place again and it's it's a, it's a huge responsibility i had a little stint as a scuba diving instructor so i, I know what you're talking oh, about yeah. like being being yeah. with a group of people that might be older than you, but you're fully responsible for their, them coming home safely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had some difficult times. I mean, uh, one time we, we lost, we were in the jungle for the whole night in Costa Rica. The, uh, the police with helicopters were looking for us because I, I hired the wrong local guide. The, the guy didn't know the way. And another time in Colombia, we just entered the FARC territory. That was in 1983, 1993. And uh, yeah, and we were kept uh, in uh, when we came out of the territory. The park wasn't there, but we were in that territory. We didn't know it actually. And uh, when we came out of it, we were uh, I was uh, locked into uh, you know in the police station, and uh, they they did a hearing to uh, to explain what this group of Dutch people were doing in the park territory. Uh, I <laughs> so these kind of know, stories are, are 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 good lessons learned to 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 help you to. Uh, yeah, to, know, to understand what risks and responsibilities are. I can, I can sense, I mean, this is so exciting what, what you've just shared up to now that, that at some point you should write an autobiography. These kind of stories sound really... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, I'm not a good writer, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah. And but after that, how, uh, how did you make the move into working with the IOCN then? Because yeah, so, so uh, at a certain moment, I was fed up with traveling because I was always traveling and I couldn't, you know, actually my dream was to work for a conservation organization. And IOCN was always on my number one list because I loved that principle. I loved the red list of threatened species, understood how this huge network of, of umbrella organization was working. So since I was a kid, I already knew when I was reading the magazines of WWF, I knew that the organization behind WWF was IUCN. That's where the science and the knowledge was. So I wanted to, to join IUCN. And uh, I decided to go back to the Netherlands and stay there for a while. I became a teacher in biology just to, to have a kind of, uh, you know, a, a job to stay there, to look into um, magazines for positions, potential uh, vacancies. And um, at a certain moment, I, uh, there was a vacancy of IUCN in the Netherlands, which actually I didn't exist that IUCN had a presence, any presence in the Netherlands, uh, which was a very tiny organization, the IUCN National Committee of the Netherlands. And uh, they looked for a person who could, um, who could run a fund, a small grants facility for rainforest conservation, uh, because they were able to get some funding from overseas development in the Netherlands to fund rainforest conservation projects. This was in the 90s, 1995. And I was able to get that position. And I ran that fund for four and a half years, almost five years, uh, and make it successful. I was able to get more funding on board from the Dutch government. And at a certain moment, the board asked me to become the director of IOC Netherlands. And then I said, yes, but give me the time. I need at least 10 years to get the potential of IOC in the Netherlands out. Uh, and that's what I did. So from 2000 to 2012, I was able to actually to fulfill that dream and and, and I, I remember signing it. I, I remember when the board asked me, I said, so this is the potential of ISIN in the Netherlands and here are we now. So give me 10 years to fully create this, open up this potential uh, with funds, with more members, uh, with more influence, with more communication and dialogues, also with the business community. And um, yeah, and that's what I did actually. See, this is, this is what, I've, what I keep finding everywhere. Like there, there's this close 
group of people working within regenerative development with, with certain, they have a very, very um, clear frameworks and the word potential is, is, is one of them. Um, but then there are lots of people who naturally, without necessarily um, knowing the, the, the frameworks that um, um, Kara Samford and, and, and that particular, the Regenesis group and that lineage of regeneration has developed, are actually working naturally from that, from understanding nested wholeness, from understanding the, 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 the need for developmental long-term evolutionary work, um, and from starting from um, starting from potential rather than problems. And they, well, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I find it really interesting because one of the amazing things that, that I think make the approach, the four returns approach of um, Common Land, which we'll get to in a minute, um, so unique is the the conviction and the the audacity to clearly say from the beginning this is going to take 20 25 years um and not pretend yeah. anything else and and i i didn't know that you you also when when you took on the job with iucn you you told them don't give me just a few years basically like th this is going to take some time and yeah. and good transformation need to be curated over time patiently um yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know how, how this happened, but it's it, it's exactly how you describe it. It's I always look from uh, you know first of all I love problems. Uh, I don't look them up, but they but, but I love problems because then you have something to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, and and yeah, the the uh, the potential. There's always a potential, and in nature there's always a potential. So I'm, I'm an optimist as well. Uh, I'm not a, a, a because otherwise I could never do this this work. Because I've seen, uh, as you probably can imagine, and I'm sure you, you recognize that, yeah, you see all the destruction and all the negative stuff, species loss, biodiversity loss, uh, you know, all the, 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 the degradation, degradation stuff. And also, and of course, all of those people, sad people live in those areas as well. But, um, um, it, uh, yeah, sorry? So, so like I, I was just wanting to ask something about the IUCN work, because in yeah. that time, you, I mean, basically IUCN Netherlands became the strongest IUCN national um yeah yeah so so what what, what happened was um if you so if you want to use the potential of a beautiful brand of icm which is is you know you have sign it's science based and there are great people working there i'm still a member of that family mm -hmm. uh, i will never leave that family because i'm still associated to icm as a fellow in the, in, in the commission uh, but but um if you see that potential of science, of NGOs, you know, more than a thousand members working in the field, of the, the connection with the governments, because members, there, is all, there are also government members. And then the, the uh, you know, the, the potential that, that you can offer to offer as a scientific based organization with practical experience to, towards the business uh, and get them on board on all kinds of things. Uh, um, uh, if you see that huge potential, um, the question is how can you make sure that you can develop that potential while you're also part of a, let's say, a bureaucratic organization. And um, the, the, the great advantage of a national part of IUCN was that I was able, uh, no, that, that this, this national committee of IUCN within a country needs to, is structured along the lines, along national lines. So I needed to convince my, my, my friends at the NGOs who are a member in the Netherlands, 37 organizations, I think at that time, when I started like 28, when I left like 37. And they were my board. They were, so, so if I could convince them to open up that space without competing with them, because they were large, you know, WWF Netherlands is a large and important organization. So you don't need, to, you don't want to compete. You want to add value to all, you know, all of them. And I was looking for that space. How can I, as Irish and Netherlands, add value to those 37 organizations, add value to the Dutch government with their funding mechanisms and overseas development aid, and add value to the Irish and national, international network, including the scientists and the secretariat in Switzerland, without competing, but, but still, how can I open up that space? And that was, I think, my biggest challenge to open up that space, make sure that I was able to raise my own funds, our own funds, mm -hmm. without uh, asking funds from the Swiss headquarters, uh, but able, but be able to add more members internationally through, you know, as a, through through our grant mechanism, we could ask new foundations in whatever countries to also to become an Irish member. 
So actually this ended up uh, after 10 years in more, almost 200 extra new members, local NGOs for Irishian International. And, and um, when people, but, but it is a, it's a balancing act because you, you, know, um, you need to talk a lot and uh, so that people get an understanding, yeah, we are not competing, we are adding value to the network and the union. And that was my most, yeah, that was the thing I was always worried about and tried to, to, to do. But that, but again, the, I fa find that that's also a pattern that I, I see um, through observing your way of working also in with, with, with Common Land, that it's all about acknowledging that there can be tendencies for different organizations as they come together to, to do work to, together, actually to start competing for funding sources and for, for competing for turf in what they traditionally are doing. And that the trick is bringing everybody with a vision that is long-term enough and big enough and holistic enough into a space where they understand that they can shift from competitive advantage to collaborative advantage and yeah. they can yeah. actually stay in doing what they're doing well. And that's great because then the others don't need to do that, but they can trust that that's done well <laughs> yeah. by somebody, uh, but they can build something bigger and more transformative together, which is the, the the collaborative advantage. Yeah, I think you hear you, you hear you, um, and I, I I didn't realize that at that time when I was doing it. But mm -hmm. basically, what you say, yeah, we were creating a kind of a space, mm -hmm. and within that space, there was there was space for organizations to to work with, uh, to work, raise funds together, mm -hmm. to do lobbying together based on the different roles and and, and networks uh, the different organizations that people had. And um, I think that's why Irish and Netherlands could grow extensively uh, because we could we, we we're building both the trust towards the Dutch government as well as uh, the international uh, headquarters as as we were bringing new energy to members and bringing in new members as well. And, um, and you, you also, I mean, you you made very good inroads with philanthropic money around the world and we're able to through through IOC and funnel a lot of funds into projects all over the world you financed many projects in in South America and and, and other places in Central America yeah. um yeah maybe, in, but maybe maybe to 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 bring the expectations a little bit down it was it, it were small grants so uh -huh. uh, it was not a lot of money um, I think the overall budget was like 10 million euros per year so it, it it was not the hundreds and hundreds millions um, but but what I realized is that the small grants are those seed money initiative for That's grassroots awesome. organizations are essential and if you can help them to move then towards larger grants uh, from other institutions, um, you know, I think that's that was what our role at that time and is and and still is, I think, with IFM yeah. and others. This is this is also fascinating. I wasn't going to go there, but you, no, no, um, you made me think about when when I was working with the team that had set up the Lush Spring Prize um, that Lush set up a few years ago, and um, we were like the invited a team of 12 judges to help them select who gets the prize. And they're relatively small prizes. They're um, basically kind of in the range of from 10 to 25,000. So minuscule to some extent compared to um, the, the big funding organizations. But we realized very quickly that there was such wealth in all the organizations that had made it into the runner-up stage had been selected and vetted by the pre-selection process and then 12 international judges and, had been, and, and all the judges were constantly saying we're looking 52 projects and really 49 or 48 of them should be funded um, but we can only give 11 prizes mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so so we started to explore could we not network with other prizes around the world and create a platform where all these runner-ups are showcased as wonderful projects that deserve um, funding and that have already been vetted by a selection process. And out of that grew this platform that is still somewhat in development, currently looking for the next stage of funding called the Regenerosity um, oh, Network. Yeah. Um, and one of the central things that you've just made me think about is precisely this problem that there are lots of foundations out there for whom 500,000 is a small grant that on the board of directors meeting doesn't even get 
discussed. Just somebody says, and then there's these five projects that we also want to fund, and they either just sort of say okay, or they they say no. Well, let's put that money somewhere else. Um, but for many projects that are doing very place source, place based, grassroots, community sourced regeneration, getting five hundred thousand in one bulk might already be a bit too much to handle. They they yeah. what they would need is. 50,000 every year for 10 years to get ready oh. to then maybe receive 500,000. Now, I hear, hear you point out a critical element, and that's what we uh, that's what I took over uh, in Common End. And that's, um, you know, if you want to bring change in the landscape, and quite often NGOs want to do that because mm -hmm. they see nasty situation, deforestations, whatever, they want to bring change. And um, um, the, let's say the charity world is focused around uh, results and uh, short-termism funding, uh, which is it, it has its history, you could say. Or a, a funder, many of those funders need to need to um, uh, need to reply to their funders where the where the money will go and whether the results are um, are achieved. But in difficult circumstances, where all those local NGOs and indigenous communities are working. Um, you can't predict. Uh, you can't predict exactly how your money is spent and what kind of results uh, it will 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 go will be achieved. So what you need to do actually is try is try is to fund the staff. So get the best people there, local people. Make sure that they don't need to worry about their salary, so that they can do their work well for the long term, long run. And what is the long run? Yeah, of course, our work is about decades. Uh, um, it is difficult, um, uh, but but it you know plants or trees do do grow, but you don't grow faster because because you put some pour some money over it. Uh, and 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 planting trees is, I always say, planting trees is the most easy thing to do, but getting the trees mature over let's say a hundred years, that is the most difficult things to do. I mean, Google and Amazon can't do that. You know, all those tech companies, they can't even do that. We need to have good people in the field, make sure that it, it, those trees are not cut, uh, that, just as an example. Um, so so um, funding of projects mean, for funding of projects, it means that you need to make sure that, that the staff is well covered and that you have, reliable trustful knowledgeable people and and human people human beings who can who, who can where you can take away a little bit of the worries of that they need to think about fundraising every six months because thinking about fundraising that sucks so much energy basically that you can't do your work and you are hired to do the work on the ground with farmers with local conservationists with indigenous people with all those people living there to, to protect, restore, and, and bring people together to transform their vision and, and life into a regenerative way of living. And that is very difficult. So um, that's why it's one of the reasons why we, as, when I started Commonland was that I wanted to focus on first build a strong organization with a good staff that don't need to worry every, every month about fundraising. And then we can create a vehicle to work with others and and help them uh, to to make sure that they can uh, do whatever is needed in, at the landscape level. So I I understand that at some point, despite of all your love and all all your amazing service um, to IUCN, it was the sea that you grew out of in the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. I I, I sense that you 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 step beyond con conservation to regeneration yeah. and the yeah, no, it's it's no it, it i'm still a conservationist and a very uh, and, and so so it's not that i stepped out of conservation i mean i i i'm still connected to i mm -hmm. assume also to other organizations that work on conservation and we just celebrated at the moment uh, uh, a publication will be released next month on 20 years of uh, a land acquisition fund which i started in 2001 with lottery money at iucn uh, so that is buying lands to conserve it locally with local or NGOs, of course, uh, and and that you know I, we I think we spent more or less ten million over the last twenty years in tiny protected areas that we could that we needed to buy 
because that was the only way to protect it. You know, if you have some small endemic species that live there within a small uh, water catchment or rainforest area, and you, the only way is to, to, to make sure you protect those species by buying that land. Otherwise, a mining company or an oil palm company will consume it. Mm. It's a very powerful tool. Um, so I'm very happy that, that this fund still continues. Uh, no, but what, 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 I, what, I, what I was getting the, with, with the conservation is that even if you have a reserve like that, it doesn't necessarily fully protect it. In no, no, so exactly. So I'm going to that point exactly. So, so what, what frustrates now, maybe, yeah, what, what I realized after so many years working, 17 years working with IUCN in the Netherlands, uh, especially abroad, uh, internationally, and, and funding a lot of projects, that you could indeed fund, let's say, a thousand hectares project of rain uh, conserving rainforest in let's say the brazilian amazon but then at a certain moment that island of rainforest it, it became an island of rainforest in a, in a soy belt or in a palm oil belt because around it uh, everything was cleared for monocultural agricultural cropping or livestock or whatever and um for me, it was important to bring those things together. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not against agriculture, but I see the danger of large monoculture agriculture deserts, uh, um, uh, and and we need to weave these things into a, a landscape approach. And within IUCN, we always call that a mosaic landscape. Mm -hmm. And the concept of mosaic landscape was built upon what within IUCN we call the ecosystem approach. And the ecosystem approach is a wonderful document. If you can find it on the web, you should Google it. Because it, it was actually um, written by people from IUCN in the 90s, and it was accepted by the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1995. Uh, but it was a theoretical concept. And for me, I always thought, you know, the, that ecosystem approach means people need to live within an ecosystem approach. And we have the scientific parameters of what an ecosystem approach is, but now we need to make it practical. But how? Uh, because otherwise, you, you, you know, it, it doesn't work. It stays within international conventions and, and scientists can use it, but, you know, we need to live it, actually. And when I had built that, all that experience, all those experiences within IUCN with grants and with working with business and so on, and, and with NGOs, at, at, at a certain time in 2010, and nine, I realized I need I, I need to need to go towards the next step for myself, and I probably cannot do this next step within an institution like IUCN. Uh, but I didn't know that at that time. For me, the moment the, the moment when I when my eyes were opened was when I met John Deview in two thousand and nine uh, at a conference in Talberg in Sweden, and he gave a presentation and um, he showed his beautiful footage of the Lust Plateau. And then, and I immediately saw that the Lust Plateau actually was implementing in a kind of a way the ecosystem approach. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, now I've got finally someone who filmed and documented large scale an ecosystem approach. So I went to him, I said, listen, guy, I don't know you, you don't know me. I'm Willem from the Netherlands, I'm heading out in the Netherlands, you are John Deview, but we need to work together. Mm -hmm. And this, again, <laughs> without knowing it, I said, and we need to work together for the rest of our life. All else is history. Yeah. Well, I didn't know the guy. He didn't know me. Uh, and then we sat together and we were talking almost for three days and the whole conference, we forgot about the conference and we were talking the whole, you know, talking for three days at night because it didn't, you know, it was in summertime in Sweden, almost no nights. And, um, and that went to a cooperation, uh, a collaboration. So I hired John. He came uh, working for us at that, at that time with IUCN. He was able to produce with my support, our support, uh, documentaries uh, that were uh, everywhere, uh, uh, like Green Gold and like uh, like uh, a time of change in climate, uh, BBC documentaries and so on. So we we were teaming up together. Mm -hmm. uh, because he could speak out and he could communicate this, this very well in his way of, of, of communication. And meanwhile, I will, it gave me the time to rethink and also conclude at a certain moment that I needed to leave Aishin and, and need to take more time, a sabbatical, which I did in 2012, to interview farmers and investors. Because if we want to change 
this system and build the ecosystem approach into an economic landscape approach, um, we need to bring on board all those external parties, business, investors, but you know, who is living there? Indigenous people and farmers. They are living on the rural countryside. And of course, some, some other people, but they are, they are impacting that landscape in a positive or a negative way. If it is in a negative way, we consumers through co corporates and investors are behind that because we want all kinds of things out of those landscapes. Um, so I went to those, I took a year off. I actually, I, I quit with my job. And the next, I remember the day, you know, first you have a whole office with a secretary and a PA and whatever. And then the next day you're sitting alone, like here in my room. And I say, okay. Um, and my mailbox was gradually going down. Okay, uh, where am I? What did I do? Had no income, had a kids and a family. So it was a bit scary and risky. But on the other hand, it also felt very much free. And I'm a little bit entrepreneurial. You know, it felt like, you know, now I can take the next step. Of course, this danger of, you know, no income was becoming readily bigger and bigger. But there were finally, uh, after a few months, people came to me and said, how can I help you? And there were some people with some deeper pockets than I had, and they helped me to survive, which was wonderful. Um, so I was able to visit and travel a lot in that period. And I asked farmers and investors basically two questions. So I went to London, New York, Frankfurt, uh, and, and Amsterdam and spoke to investors, especially institutional investors or pension funds. And I went to poor farmers and wealthy farmers in, in the US, in the UK, in Europe, France, the Netherlands, Spain, but also places like India, Ghana, uh, South Africa, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, so several places, Turkey. And I spoke, I met all those farmers and, asked, and, and investors and basically asked them two questions. Um, the first question, was, question was, what is your biggest frustration? And the second question is, was, what is your dream? And um, almost all the farmers, whether they were poor or rich, it didn't matter, uh, answered on the frustration that the biggest frustration was that they could not hand over their land in a better condition as they have received it. And when I ask about their dreams, their dreams were, were in general, their dreams were, we want to live and produce in a landscape that is uh, li alive, that is green, uh, where people can live and come back. We don't, we, the biggest, you know, their dream was, we want to have that the people come back because they were living in abandoned land quite often. People were moving to cities, which is still the big trend, as you know. And they missed their, you know, communities. In Spain, schools were closed, churches were closed, you know, the swimming pool was closed. So, uh, and only all people were living there. So the community was number one. And then the next, the, 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 in their dream, it was give us a community back and then give us a landscape back where we can produce within an ecological setting so that we don't harm the landscape. And we know how to do that, but we are not, you know, we're not uh, financed to do that. We are financed to do other things. That was the farmer story. The, the investment, the investor story, uh, you know, I've just summarized it, was in, interesting as well. So I spoke to people from our age, and, and they, some of them were old and had kids, you know, and puberty, and kids in their puberty, and, and, and their trends or 30s. And when I asked the question about frustration, says that they said in general, we are, I'm frustrated because I'm investing in destroying the future of my kids and my kids are telling me that and blaming me for it but you know i've got a big house two cars you know i can't step out of this job uh, so it's uh, so they were actually they had a crisis within a generational crisis um and that was in 2012 even before greater turnberg and so came on <laughs> we're pointing this out uh, and, and when you when i was asking them about their dream um, it was more about, yeah, th their dream would be in their job. First of all, it would be that they could invest in the future of their kids. But that means that their dream would be that they could find pipeline of real positive, sustainable projects. But they couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. The projects that were, they were funded and were called sustainable were projects that were doing less harm. Mm -hmm. And, and that was their, so 
lack of pipeline on the one side and lack of funding to do good on the other side at farmland level. Those two things were connected, of course. And I thought, how can I build that bridge in a language that both farmers, ecologists, as well as investors and business will understand? And that brought me back to simplify the whole discussion on ecological degradation. Simplify it to one sentence. And that sentence is, maximization of return on investment per hectare leads to degradation. Because, you know, in every business school, and, you know, it, it, when I was in my sabbatical, I became a fellow at the Rotterdam School of Management as well, a business school. They didn't know at, you know, at all what ecology was. So, so but every business school still is teaching maximization of return on investment is the big holy grail. That's where you, you know, your destination lies as a business person. But if you put at two words per hectare, you get biodiversity loss, soil erosion, production loss, a loss of resilience at landscape level, water scarcity, all these things we don't want to know, deforestation, pollution, you get it all. And so I simplified that. Maximization of return on investment per hectare is the common belief economic system that is suffering, you know, that's creating all these nasty things at the landscape or ecosystem level. The interesting thing is, I realized in my discussions with the investors and with the farmers that the word return was critical. Everyone is looking for a return. But what is a return? When investors speak about return, they only mean financial returns and they prefer to speak in double digits. When the farmer speaks about return, the first return he wanted was people. Let the people come back. The second one was, yes, I would love to have some more income, of course, but sustainable income. But I don't want to get rid of my land because that's holy. That's my, you know, I, that's my whole history. It's my land and, and, and generations before that. So for farmer land is super important, which of course, uh, and, and especially for indigenous people, it's even much more important because they have a longer history. And of course, there's tension with colonists and so on, but uh, I won't go into that now. So return was critical, the word return. So I decided, you know, if, if that maximization of financial return per hectare is the real stuff simplified in one sentence, then there are losses at the landscape level. But if you look into how many losses there are, there are so many losses. And I brought it down to four losses because people who are living there lost their sense of meaning and their pride. That's what I noticed when I spoke to farmers and I, I knew it already for, 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 for decades when I spoke to indigenous people. Uh, the second loss is that they lost their community and they lost because jobs were going away. So they lost jobs, social capital. And the third loss was biodiversity. You know, the whole vegetation cover, all that had to do with biodiversity and, and species and the natural system. And as a result of that, the fourth loss at the long run is financial capital. Because at a certain moment, the system is so degraded that people move away that you can't do anything with those wastelands anymore. No financial capital. So those four losses are the basis of my, you could say, model that I designed uh, to create a language model to build a bridge between all those different groups and that was if we want to restore landscapes based on an ecosystem approach the science underneath then we need to talk about four returns we need to return inspiration we need to return social capital jobs we need to return biodiversity and that will give sustainable return of financial capital or you could say you no know, uh, return of sustainable financial capital so that was the first layer of the model and that but still theory because if you explain it like you and you can put indicators under those different returns return of inspiration is probably the most difficult but the most important one and you can you, you, you can put a lot of indicators under that and that's what i did and i wrote it now but to get it landed at the landscape level you need to talk about landscape zoning and that is where ecologists like you and me where, where you know understand how zoning works I and mean, you need to think first of all you need to understand what an ecosystem is so i was 
always approaching landscape from an ecosystem perspective. It means that you yeah, you're talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands of hectares, mm. uh, because this is about a large landscape. If you talk about uh, the ecosystem of the Amazon, there are different type of rainforests in the Amazon basin. Uh, and you can see the Amazon is a huge area, but if you look into it carefully, you can say, okay, there's a different, there's a type of Amazon forest between two river catchments there, uh, or tributaries of the Amazon. And if you take that area, it's maybe 50,000 or 100,000 or even 500,000 hectares. And within these areas, actually, and in a landscape perspective, you need to bring it back to three zones. Normally, we bring it back to two zones. That's what happens all over the world. You have an economic zone where people are active, land use, mining, agriculture, infrastructure, cities, buildings, etc. And you have what we call a protected area. Uh, that is where we say, okay, there, nature should be more dominant in that place. And so we have a natural zone, protected area, or even you know, still quite often not protected, but it's still natural, but it may move into an economic zone. And you have an economic zone. But the in-between zone is actually where the magic can happen. Of course, we need to protect as much as possible, especially now in these days. And yes, we understand the economic zone, but the in-between zone is almost not present in most countries. And we call that, we call that the combined zone. So that's the place where you can produce two things. You produce food and fibers with agriculture and you produce biodiversity. And if you do that well, then you create regenerative agricultural or regenerative agroforestry systems. And we know that, that this is possible from you know, a lot of experience in nowadays in regenerative agriculture and permaculture. We know that this is possible. Uh, but it means we need to have a, it change, it, it's a mindset change. But, for, yeah, for but, but, but it's, it's so fascinating how important mimetics and framing actually are in all of this. Because the classic um, ecologist language would call that a buffer zone. A buffer is, is, is a framing that makes it come, there's this and there's this, and we have something to keep them apart. Yeah? It, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but a combined zone is, is the opposite. It's, it's again, yeah. bridge building. It's saying, okay, we, th there is a way that we can um, increase bioproductivity and diversity in this area and still do it in a way that we regeneratively harvest. We, we improve yeah. the landscape, but we actually get value out of it. And because we do that, we create enough financial return to the people in the, in the industrial zone, in the, in the um, sorry, but, uh, uh, the, the, the economic zone, but the economic zone, yeah, yeah. That, that there is no reason to invade the protected zone in, in, a, in a way that um, happens all over the world, where you get large nature reserves, biodiversity reserves with UN labels on them, and they're not worth the um, paper that they're written on because um, people have economic pressures and and therefore um, the, the reserve can't be enforced. But if you have yeah. a combined zone, that helps you to enf enforce the reserve. No, that that's that, that's that is very much true. And I realized something else. Um, that is the combined zone is um, the combined zone is also get no. Farmers get a better understanding of what the natural zone can provide for, can mean for them yeah. uh, through the combined zone because they're going to rethink what this combination of biodiversity and productivity means. Mm -hmm. And for city people, um, of course, they know quite often how important the natural zone is, but they have no idea what it is to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they can build a bridge to the farmer or to the conservationist or the indigenous uh, uh, community. So, so, um, but you need to have a kind of a landscape and an ecosystem that covers that. So, so it's important that, that, that you understand what a natural ecosystem is and where this mosaic landscape setting or three zone setting uh, can be part of. Um, and that's why we, uh, when we, so, so this is, so, so the four returns is about measurement and uh, the opposite of the maximization of the return on investment idea. The, the three zones is how to deliver the four returns within a landscape. 
And the last component is, of course, time. Uh, being so much frustrated about projects of four years or three years of maximum five years with, with donors and so on, um, I very much looked into the large infrastructure world. You know, if you want to plan a high-speed train between Madrid and Paris, you can't do that in an overnight. Uh, maybe in China they do it in a few years, but in Europe it will take more years, and in, in other places it will take a lot of years. So um, time is super important. And here, of course, the ecologists would say we need a decade, we need a century. Um, but the investor who has been used working with large infrastructural investments, uh, dredging or, or building cities or whatever, will probably say, no, we need a decade or two. Uh, so I, I brought in two decades minimum, so 20 years, uh, also because that is very much in tune with uh, generational thinking. So a generation. And uh, so I said, okay, four returns are delivered by a three zone approach in minimum 20 years. Uh, because then you, first of all, you, you can build trust within a landscape in 20 years. You can't build trust with consultants and NGOs if you have only a four years project. You can build relations, that's right. But building trust is very difficult and it can go away before you know it. Um, and, and because these, these things are going like that, people come and go uh, in a landscape. And um, yeah, and that's, that's how it all started. So what I did is I wrote it down, published it, and asked my, my, my colleagues from the ecological world, from UNEP, from WWF, from IUCN, to, to reflect on this document. And, um, and that happened in 2000, between 2013 and, and, and 14. And in 2015, the second document was published with all those uh, um, uh, people having looked at it uh, at the Erasmus University, the Rotterdam School of Management, and within the IUCN uh, Commission on Ecosystem Management. So that is the the, the ecology, the science scientists of ecologists within IUCN. So I brought I brought those two worlds together in one publication: the business school world and the ecology scientists. So, yeah, that. <laughs> Well, it was not easy, but it was very fascinating to do. But I mean, I'll, I'll link in when I post this um, conversation. I will link the the two documents because it's it exists downloadable as a PDF in Spanish and in English. Um, so I'll yeah, just that's right. put them yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's maybe it's yeah, it's maybe a bit technical, but uh, uh, yeah, for me it was uh, it's, it was important to write that down. And then, um, and then when when is the actual founding of Common land as an organization happened. Yeah. I, th I thought you found it. In, um, it it now sounds like it was. I found it in, I in April 2013. Okay. So, so uh, I so it took me so uh, more or less a year after I left IUCN, I published my first paper, uh, which was not yet ready, in November 2012. Uh, I think it's somewhere on the web still. And um, and then I found it common land in April 2013 because then. I remember at a certain moment you had this you had this this feeling yes I got it I've got it and I wrote it down you know but but very superficial in in in, in PDFs and whatever in and it was not yet publicable but I was so anxious to immediately do it that I thought yeah um, what can I do can I join WWF or IUCN some some of them of my former colleagues asked me in Switzerland can you join us um, but I thought yeah maybe I need the space first to test it. And the only way to test it, you need to have a team. And yeah, you need to have the freedom to test it. So you need to have the resources and let's say the legal constituency to do it in a, in a way you, you, want, you want to do it. And that's when I thought, let's, let's, let's found a common land. And that, in 2013, in April, we founded it first in a different name, Ecosystem Restoration Foundation or Ecosystem Return Foundation, but then we, we ask others to look at it and they said, yeah, this is such a difficult name. No one will get it. Uh, you need to think about others as well. And uh, it turned uh, in, in Mar, I think in April, no, in July 2014, we turned, we, we changed the name in Common Land. Yeah. And, but it's grown so rapidly. Now you have, what, 30 some staff and you, you have four major pilot projects in, in um, South Africa, in Australia, in the Netherlands and in Spain and are growing a network of partnerships all around the world um, to, to take this approach to all countries. Yeah, yeah, luckily enough, and that yeah. was only possible because I found a co-founder 
-hmm. and that was that was a philanthropist that was actually a businessman in the Netherlands um, and I remember that uh, I didn't know him but he at a certain moment he called me after my first publication and he said listen you are doing interesting work let's talk and we had a very uh, yeah we, we were talking to each other let's say within a year also through his the his the director of his philanthropic foundation at that moment and um yeah he didn't he didn't he got it but uh, he wanted to know know me better and so on but at a certain moment we decided we will we will create common land together mm -hmm. because he had the resources the financial resources and I had the knowledge network and the idea, and um, and and that's how we did it together. So actually, you could say uh, we co-founded uh, Common Land together. Of course, I start I founded it in 2013, and he uh, joined. Um, he said yes to fund the first process in hey. December 2013. So from 2014 onwards. Is is this the gentleman behind? Because I just recently um, I had a conversation with somebody who kept talking to me about Common Earth, and then I Common Dot Earth, and um, which is the, the organization that grew out of the conversation I've had with um, Cloud Burst Foundation and the Commonwealth Secretariat, and was was officially launched last October. Um, the website mm -hmm. is Common with two M's Dot Earth, and then I found out that there's a website. C, big C, big O, small M. Yes, exactly. So, M so what happens? Yeah, exactly. So what happened is that at that time, um, uh, Mr. Pom, that's his name. He, this, that's the big businessman here in the Netherlands, Wijnand uh, uh, Pom, uh, where you know where we found each other. You could say uh, he came from this whole family business network, and I came from the ecological network. And um, yeah, he started this Come On Foundation. It means come on, and um, uh, which it which indeed turned into this come on dot earth website, mm -hmm. and uh, so that is our that started to become our major funder. Uh, and when I started Commonland, I he was you know um, I could we could finally team up and said listen what I need is long term funding for a team. If I want to accelerate this whole difficult transformational process at a landscape scale. And make sure that we can go fast. I don't want to worry every four or three or two years about raising funds for a team, and I need 25 people. So, and and that's basically uh, the minimum multidisciplinary team to kickstart this whole work. Uh, I've set up before, as I said, I've been working in the in the startup phases of SMP Natura and and IOC, and so I knew what it was to, to create startups and move from startup to a scale up. And of course, if you move to a scale up, you need different kinds of people, uh, uh, people who are more structured. And we are in that phase now, so that's wonderful. But but in that phase, I needed to build a team. And I knew what type, what type of people I needed, you know, uh, people in the space of, of creating uh, co-creation processes. I needed people with financial expertise, with ecological expertise, um, uh, business expertise, business development expertise. So all that's, how to bring them all together and work together at a landscape scale and then work and identify landscape so i i knew of course due to my background i knew what kind of criteria you were need, you need to look at before starting a project at a land you know within, within a concrete landscape and I decided to first start in countries that were less difficult uh, you know spain is less difficult than southern sudan but Southern Sudan needs a lot of ecological uh, restoration projects, of course. But if you start there, you know, you probably, it will be more tough. And this is already easy, not easy. So I started to, to work in countries like Australia, uh, South Africa, Spain, and later on also in the Netherlands. Could, could you explain a little bit, um, also for, for my benefit of, of how, how to maybe um, ground a similar process maybe in collaboration with with you and and um, common land here on mallorca the the actual process of engagement because the largest of those um core pilot projects that that common land has is the one in spain the alvalal um pro yeah. project. Um, and it's a, it's a million million um, hectares. hectares yeah, uh, yeah. huge area near murcia um, how do you, I, I mean, I know a little bit, you use a pro, um, th th process you or theory you approach to create um, a multi-stakeholder 
process of yeah now there are, there are steps. Yeah, yeah there are some steps you need to take into uh, look at first of all there are so many places over the world that are degraded you know uh, we are talking about two billion hectares you know double the size of china that is degraded and it's probably too mo much more and it's going fast so there are lots of opportunities everywhere you can do this everywhere um, I've realized, by the way, now after seven years of testing and building the concept that the four returns three zone approach works everywhere. Uh, to my actually, to my surprise, also in marine areas, it's it's uh, it, it, it's an ecosystem approach. It's a practical translation of the of the of this beautiful ecosystem approach. This is precisely where I want to go about Mallorca because Mallorca yeah. and so, the Balearics have the marine terrestrial. Exactly. Let's go there later. Yeah. Yeah. So, so exactly. So so for instance, we also work together with the Charles Darwin Foundation and the Gal on the Galapagos, which is a similar way of you know, uh, like if you talk about an island situation. But so some steps, um, it in some criteria. So yes. Uh, it's easier to work in, in better covenants countries than in weak countries, less stable countries, but you, but it can it can be done everywhere. Um, I think the business drivers need to be clear. So what kind of agriculture or, or land use activities are there and are there potential to transform that from a destructive agriculture to more regenerative and positive agriculture? Uh, that's important. And if there's already a potential like the almonds in Spain, you know, it's easy to, not, not easy, but it is still easier to transform an almond monoculture into an agroforestry system mm. uh, uh, than, than something that's just not there or, or cereals into. Uh, so the, this, the very important also is, are there people who live there, want to stay there and really are open for change? And have the leadership guts and skills to do that. We very much carefully, carefully look to this. That could be an NGO. It could be, you know, but, but people, so a, a kind of breeding ground of people that understand mm -hmm. this and are open for change. What I also realize is that crisis is important. The, the, the more severe the crisis is at the landscape scale, the easier yeah. people are want to transform and change. Um, and of course, the ecological conditions. You know. Um, we can talk at length by the Altiplano in Spain, uh, but you know, from an ecological perspective, it is pretty difficult because the trees are not going growing fast. You have a, 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 a you have a cold winter and a hot summer, so the growing seasons are actually only in spring and in autumn. While, for instance, in the tropical wet system, uh, you have a, a almost a growing season whole year round, and uh, you see the difference much faster. And uh, then within a few years, you can, you know, you, a secondary forest in a rainforest area, if you have the right conditions, within a, within within two years, you have you have meters of, of vegetation. So, and that's definitely not the case in Spain. So, so all these things you need to take into consideration. And then you have, of course, the policies uh, that are available and the potential of funders that might be interested in these places. So you need to look into all these different layers before you take the right the decision to work there. But number one are the people. You know, if you have a core group of good people who really want to work on this for decades, then then you have uh, you have something very 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 powerful. Uh, three years ago, when 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 we met on your holiday here in Mallorca, um, we already sort of started a conversation about the potential in both Mallorca and the Balearic Islands with, with this, uh, a lot of international global attention. A lot of people know these islands, come here regularly on holiday or even have second homes here. Um, it's a unique opportunity to look at the combination between how does terrestrial regeneration and restoration um, connect with the marine restoration that needs to happen and how are they actually because traditionally you get the, the blue conservationists and the green conservationists and they, they don't really um, look at how, how they work together. And then we already spoke about the, the Tramontana and some of the landowners that, that could potentially be interested and things have moved on a lot. And um, there's definitely all the conditions you've just named, like um, the big industry that wasn't listening three years ago is tourism because they were still making huge amounts of money. But then you said you need a crisis. 
both at an economic and a landscape level. And we, tourism pushed the, the crisis at the landscape level in terms of rapid degeneration of the island and, yeah. and the, 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 the sea. And now COVID has pushed another enormous economic um, crisis where both political and business players probably, while they have less money to support a transition at the moment because they're in panic of, um, they have certainly a lot more willingness to talk about a transformation. And then, then there's all sorts of, particularly in the marine area, there are lots of organizations that have already set up and doing wonderful work. And it, it actually needs what, what Common Land and, and you yourself are so skilled in, that they're bringing them together and, and doing yeah. uh, 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 I remember when we were talking about that, uh, and, and you know, the grating of an island, in this case Mallorca, is that you can I easily identify the zoning. Um, so, so with the zoning, the storytelling also starts. So, so this is first of all you need to how to bring together all those different opinions and people. Uh, you know, one lives in the mountain, the other one uh, in the city or whatever. Uh, you need to to tell you need to bring them together at the landscape level and tell them and and and, and create that story together. And what what our experience is is that these four returns, three zones, and twenty years helps a very is a very powerful tool to help to understand. To give them a sense of place. Where am I? What am I doing here? How is that connected to that mountaintop over there? Uh, that that's a very powerful tool. And the second thing is because these you start with inspiration and start again to question what do you what is your frustration and what is your dream. And if you ask that question to those different people and bring them together in a circle, uh, and we use the the the, the theory you model developed by the Presencing Institute. You know, you create a real powerful understanding of uh, of them together, but also what it means for them to live in that specific landscape and how these landscapes are interconnected. And if you can bring that to the next level of creating a story of, in this case, of Mallorca, where you say, okay, in Mallorca, we have these three zones and we, we have uh, uh, the potential of the combined zone, which is not yet very much developed. And we have the potential of the natural zone that could be more protected and more nurtured or whatever. And we have the potential of the economic zone that was first of all driven by tourism, but without tourism, we need to look into other opportunities. You know, what does that mean? And then you start to create, um, to, to build in, uh, let's say community feeling, business thinking, but underneath, before you know it, you start to talk about all about ecology and about what is the ecological foundation to make this happen. Uh, and, and you will realize that, of course, agriculture or the marine area are interconnected. Uh, you don't want to have the polluted uh, water and erosion stuff into the water and all that stuff. So it is a, a, it's a, just a powerful tool. And, and without knowing it sometimes it sometimes really goes fast like in spain people start to think about but if this is the case then my business actually should turn into another type of business or maybe tweak it a little bit you know use less pesticides uh, don't plough or till too much um, all these things are are gradually happening because people start to talk about it and then yeah within a few years um, that's what we've seen in all those places where we work farmers are going to talk with each other and ask others for advice how they do things. So uh, a, a conventional farmer is going to, talk, to talk, start to talk with an organic farmer and say, hey, I thought you were crazy, but maybe uh, you are doing things that are interesting for me to know. And you know, those, that conventional farmer don't need to be turned immediately into an organic farmer, but he can already deal with some things. Uh, or, 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 and that's what we see everywhere. So we are not promoting organic farming, but we promote an understanding of what ecology means. And if you start to farm with nature, what will that mean for your business, mm -hmm. but also for yourself? Uh, there's another, an, uh, another box opens. And uh, I've seen it with, talking with farmers in Australia or in Spain, but also in South Africa, you know, the, the, the meaningfulness comes back. Mm -hmm. People, farmers immediately actually, they understand what is good or bad for their soil. And if they are forced into you know, because of we consumers buy cheap things or agrotech companies sell them whatever their, their recipes, if they're forced into a kind of 
way of dealing things, then they tend to forget what it is to be reconnected to soil life or, um, uh, or a beautiful landscape or a cow under a, the shade of a tree instead of uh, other times, you know. So, so it's, it, is, it, is, um, it really taps into the soul of people. And, and that's where the, I call it the soil soul connection comes from. Uh, we all come from the soil, of course, yeah? I mean, if you understand how evolution works. Uh, but but um, it's good to be, to find that connection again. And that is a powerful driver. I remember talking to an Australian farmer, uh, I think it was last year. It was a family, a wife and, and a man. And they changed from conventional farming through organic farming on their way to regenerative farming. And of course, they went through a whole lot of steps. And I, I don't know whether they were certified or not, but uh, I remember that the, the, the farmer said, yeah, you know, it's so difficult to understand how all these ecological stuff works. But every time I'm, I'm, I'm dis discovering new things and that makes me happy and I'm asking, go out to other farmers and speak online and whatever to learn how it works. But it never stops. And then his wife said, yeah, it, I see him. So make it, it makes me happy to see him happy with all these new developments. And we feel that it's cleaner and we have almost less chemical stuff. But I also need to say some something that I don't like of organic farming and regenerative farming. And, um, and that is, we cannot plan our holidays again because the recipe farming is gone. But the nice thing of recipe farming is, you know, we knew the whole, we knew, we knew in advance for the whole year how the year would look like. And now uh, we just don't know whether we can go for a holiday because maybe this organic stuff will develop in something that we don't know. And, and that's for me as a wife, it was difficult. So it's, uh, it's nice how these things immediately have an impact on lives of people. But in general, it is positive. And now I think the market and we as consumer need to make sure that this and all, I also hope with the carbon prices that this will be driven into a new way of living that will enable us to create and, and restore landscapes uh, and bring ecology back in our mindset as well. From, from you, I mean, be, because Common Land has grown rapidly and more and more partners are coming online in, in large um, landscape projects in the global south and so on. Um, I'm sometimes wondering, is, is Mallorca and just a few small Balearic islands with their um, relatively small surface area um, still an, an interesting project to common land to in, in, engage with? I mean, for, for me, what I see so as such a huge potential here is that it is this close connection between land and sea. Um, the, the, the project of with the local university um, also investigating um, the, the climate change dimension of um, the four main Mediterranean climate zones, um, very dry, slightly more humid, there's roughly four growing yeah. zones in the Mediterranean. Yeah. And we have them all on the island because of the mountains and, and the diversity yeah. of, of Mallorca. And so there, there's a lot of transferable knowledge that, and also it being islands, what I've realized living on this island now for 10 years is that there's a, an identity that is cross nationalities that, that unites the Mediterranean basin across mm -hmm. the islands. Because for thousands of years, the people on the island, are, they, they might, the islands belong to a nation, but the people on the islands are the, the seafarers, the, yeah. the, the, are the, are the sons and daughters or uh, grand, grandchildren of, of people who have done the interchange between all those nations along the Mediterranean. So, so a Mallorcan genetically has just as much relationship to somebody on Sardinia or on Corsica, or actually more than to somebody in Madrid. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. so, so there's this potential that if we create an example of long-term landscape regeneration combining marine and terrestrial um, on the Balearics, that that could travel along the Mediterranean basin. And then, of course, if, if there's a lot of research in, in terms of climate resilience and adaptation over the long term and um, biomaterials research in the combined zone of, okay, if we 
we create create productive ecosystems. What what are the the um, oil seed fruits trees and so on that 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 we yeah. can use to create the plastics of the future and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, all of that is then also relevant to the entire Mediterranean climate zone, which includes parts of yeah. Australia, South Africa, California. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, I feel it has significance as a research lab, um, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't add a big chunk of no, area. But, yeah, I, I don't think we should always think in hectares, you know, or, or trees, a uh, number of trees. I think the, the most important thing is we need to think in ecological functionality mm -hmm. and, and what a foundation, restoring the ecological foundation and what, what uh, a Mallorca or, or the Balearic Islands, like other ar archipelagos can mean is that they can inspire others. And, um, uh, you know, as Commonlands, from a Commonland perspective, yes, we want to, we, uh, we don't want to grow as an office or we don't want to have a, lots of people. We don't want to be a super big uh, bingo, uh, multinational NGO, whatever. But what we do is want, we want others to help to use these four, to, to use the four turns methodology. So, so yes, we, you know, our, if you really ask what is my dream, then it would be how can, this four turns become the new norm instead of and, and remove that maximization of return investment per hectare norm how can we make sure that this becomes the new norm accepted by governments so that everyone will use it and it's open source you know and and you may use it you may name it maybe with a different name it's always good to have a kind of a branded name because then people will recognize it easier but but it it, it works and there are and yeah there are several steps behind it and, and it starts, in your case, in Mallorca, it starts with telling that story. Make sure that, that this, or writing it down, or publish it, or, or making it known, because it's very inspirational. And then you can peel it off in, in working level steps in activities. Uh, and then you will see, of course, that some steps are easy, some steps are very difficult, and will take years, and other steps you just go before you know it. So, um, but, we have now built those experiences at Commonland in four landscapes, and we are working in eight landscapes now. And that is, uh, and we are now already bringing on board other landscapes, as we are talking to you also and, and others in other countries, in, in Colombia, in, in, in Brazil, uh, and so on. Um, and what we increasingly see is that with this methodology, we can help to, with others, build that movement. Uh, we are partnering with other international organizations to build that movement. And, um, and yeah, I think the great thing of this time is that, 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 that there will be carbon funding potential becoming available. It will, be, it will become available. Um, and it can, be, it can be very much helpful as a tool, not as a driver. Uh, the driver should come from people and from ecology and from regenerative agriculture and these kind of things. Carbon can help as an extra income. Uh, if carbon is the only driver, then my worry is that we will get tree planting plantations in the world where we should have other type, and that, that can be uh, not be the same as bringing eco ecology foundation back. So, um, so I'm very positive about what's going on now. Um, uh, in, despite of COVID and these kind of things, this this might be very helpful. Like in the case of Mallorca, it can open up a new opportunity in in, in landscaping, and uh, and I'm also very positive about the examples uh, uh, an island group like Mallorca can play for its for, for others, uh, like in the Mediterranean basin. I mean, we all know that the Mediterranean basin was was forested before the Romans started to deforest. And, and, uh, and there were a lot of water catchment all year round, which is not the case anymore. But already in Spain, we see that if you do the right things, you get water catchment back. Uh, you, you're planting, like planting trees is pl or planting vegetation is planting rain. Um, people, yeah, yeah. Like that. Um, if you use the right species on the right place. Yeah. yeah. The, the um, potential here is really growing almost at a, at a speed that is difficult to catch up with. Um, there, there are more and more people coming into this, this alliance that um, I, I send you this, this proposal, Balearis Verde, that my, my, my friend Miguel Ramos has started. And it starts with a million trees. And, and some people 
like that hook because everybody's now talking about how good it is to tr plant trees, but it is a much more com complex proposal that, that isn't just saying like any kind of trees. It's, it's basically creating, um, particularly paying attention to, to the combined zone, basically work, yeah. working on how, how can we um, turn degraded or even um, secano, uh, non aerated land, um, not, not dry land, into mm -hmm. productive agroforestry ecosystems and, and build the soil. And um, But there's such a complexity of other aspects of this transformation because Mallorca is so heavily tourism focused mm -hmm. um, that it's yeah. almost. Yes, there's all this exemplary ecosystems restoration and how to apply the four returns. But in the process of doing this here on Mallorca, by, by default, one would also create a model for the reinvention of the role of tourism in the future, which, of course, now tourism is really interested in. Um, like I, only half a year ago, before the COVID crisis started, um, I I started this conversation about what would regenerative tourism look like, uh, turning the problem into a solution. How, how could large tourism businesses get involved in investing into the re-regionalization process that, that incentivizes farmers to regenerate their land, that, that creates capacity for re renewable energy production, that looks at um, bringing the transport infrastructure closer to home in the sense of moving towards, towards public transport driven by renewables, um, and also looking strategically over the long term as the tourism industry into how to diversify into um, a wider community owned engagement. So when tourism contracts, they actually have helped to build what comes in the future where there still is tourism, but much yeah. more contracted and a much more diverse interlinking between how the, tour the tourism becomes the, the, to some extent the economic engine of the transition yeah, but that that's that is that's um, I think that you look yeah I think that's the right way of, of of seeing it. So you know I I'm the last one who is against tourism as you may uh, know through my history, but you have all kinds of sorts of forms of tourism and uh, as as in many things if this becomes a monoculture, like in Mallorca, uh, you are becoming um, vulnerable. That's what happens now. Uh, it's it's basically the same thing with, with monocultures in, in agriculture or other monocultures in, in economic uh, development. You know, a, a wise company will have a, a lot of different ways. A, 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 you know, a, a wise company will will have a set of different niches in which that company is active. Um, I see it. I see it, for instance, in the locomotive industry. So companies who have uh, shares in bicycles are doing well, and if they have shares. In bicycles and cars you know the cars are going down the bicycles are going up uh, so it's it's this is this is uh, so this is actually also a principle in in, in ecology as you may know uh, the, the, fur, the species who disappear who are becoming threatened are the very the species who are in a very narrow niche and the 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 general species who can survive everywhere like rats are you know <laughs> they, they don't uh, they don't care um and I think if you look at it from that perspective, you can use tourism as a motor for change mm. uh, and still maintain a large part in Mallorca to, uh, within the tourism sector because it will not go away and you don't mm. want to have it go away because it can also be part of the spreading the word mm. of what because is it? If you, can you imagine if you tell this holistic story about this is our development plan for the coming decades for Mallorca, mm. what does that mean for tourism? Well, also, also because of the knock-on effect that so many of like the, the really big Spanish tourism enterprises that are global are all owned by Mallorcan families. We, yeah. and, they, and they now have their center of gravity in the Caribbean, in the Philippines, in Asia, in lots of beautiful places, also islands, there you go. And many, many islands. And so whatever they would learn about the four returns approach and long-term mm. transition over 20 years here on Mallorca, they could immediately um, look into how they would then also engage with the, the communities that they also have assets or businesses. Now, you know, Daniel, it's, um, these things, 
how to continue with this is is and that's I'm just out of the box is 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 we need in a way you need to bring people together uh, in a good environment and share these thinking yeah thinkings with presentations and then come up with the next step and the next step would be I think a kind of a a first document where people sign and say yes this is actually the direction that where we want to go and the next step could be a first document uh, in, in uh, on zoning and then uh, with nice maps and see you know this is a future perspective a first drawing of, of what a future could be and then gradually uh, you need to create a kind of a yeah a group of people uh, who can do this in a professional way and are the anchor of change, uh, you know, like our is the anchor of change, and we, we indeed, as Commonland, we support them financially to make sure that they can continue their work, because we know it's difficult. This will, this change will not come, you know, like this. You need to have people who draw this further and are on top on on the potentials of of such an area. So, so do you you do you actually hold some funds that are for the Alvalau project, and as they continue to do their work on the ground, they just say we've done this phase now, and now we're doing this. Yeah, no. So, yeah. So, so our experiences so far is that if, if we really say yes to a new area, so we have we have different uh, maybe you've seen we have different uh, circles. So we have a. A lower circle where we really want to we we, we, we as Commonland would like to help driving this for the for the coming decades and we mm -hmm. try to look for funding and then we have the a middle scale landscape where uh, that could be Mallorca where we will help you with all things we can do also to find funding but we we, we cannot to too much in be too much involved mm -hmm. and and then we have an, an upper circle where we set up platforms to exchange experiences where all kinds of type of landscape can tap into and, and, and use the tools that we have developed together. And they can use the language. So a Brazilian or NGO can, can tap into the, the, the platform and say, yes, we want to develop our Fortran's landscapes. We use these tools and then we get the Fortran's name and whatever. And, and, and they can use that also to raise funds because they have a, we create a common language together that investors and funders and carbon uh, emitters hopefully will understand at a certain moment. And coming back to Mallorca, if, if um, yeah, or, uh, sorry, to, to our experiences so far is that it, if we really do it well, it costs more or less a half a million euros per year to develop, to keep a local team up and running to develop business businesses and business de and, and make sure business developments happens to continue with small grants activities on the ground so that you can see already some change happening and learning farmers between each other and, and giving them seed money to stop tilling for instance or do less tilling or whatever or making shale swales and that that whole set of activities including the funding of this group of people this anchor this this group of people doing the theory you and so on will cost half a million per year. So we ourselves now have said, okay, if funders come to us, we just say, listen, if you want to work with us, this is how we work. If you want to partner with us, it costs you half a million euros per year for 20 years, 10 million euro for 20 years. And if you can assure or guarantee us that funding, you know, we really can take this up and uh, we can guarantee you that, that we, that we, that this transformation will take place. But if they say, yeah, we have 50,000 and um, we, we want a project, we prefer to say, okay, you can go to that organization, but we can't do it because we just don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. You cannot transform things for 50,000 at the large landscape scale. You can do a project, you can build a school, you can support a, maybe a, a small regenerative farmer or company, or, or a local NGO to protect this water catchment and plant some trees, but that's not what we mean with transformational change. That's just another project. And we want to enable that transformational change so that when funders come on board with 50 or 100 or whatever, that we have the right place and can say, yes, 50,000, that's great. And that's what we do now in Spain. In Spain, we can say, if a funder comes or an investment say, we have 50,000 or 100,000, we say, that's interesting. Let's talk to Alvalon because I think within the, in the big puzzle in the pieces, we lack this piece and that costs 50,000. Mm -hmm. So if you put it in here, it will benefit. Mm -hmm. And if it's only a standalone project, then it will probably go on. So, so to, for me to understand this better, like as a, how this could potentially work here on Mallorca, this 
I, I completely agree it needs core funding for the team to hold this over a long period of time. Um, yeah. And also it gives that team the commitment that they can truly commit their lives to making this process happen yes. because they have a long-term um, commitment yeah. to, to, to their activity. Yeah. Um, but this half a million would basically land in common land, but then benefit to most, to, to the large yeah, uh, uh, yeah. location. So, yeah, so, so how we work now with those four core, core landscapes, <coughs> So we are funded as a team in Commonland. That's mm -hmm. separate. Mm -hmm. And we have a separate budget line mm -hmm. um, for Alvalau, for South Africa or Australia, which is 400,000 euros or 500,000 euros. It depends, but 400,000 euros. And that is going directly to those local landscapes. We are not in between. We don't take anything out of it, no percentages or whatever, because we are funded. But, but, but you are holding because sometimes as you build those local networks it, it, there might not be i mean i can think of a number of organizations that that have the track record here that they would give an investor the confidence i can put money into that account but but you are offering the account as well no like uh, at this moment yeah. yes yeah. but we are i mean all the law is open to raise their own funds mm -hmm. but, we, but we will make sure that they don't need to worry about their cornerstone their their, their existence Mm -hmm. And they raise their own funds. Uh, so we, we have raised funds with Alvalol, um, to a care foundation, for instance. We, have, we brought them on board and they wanted to give the money to us. And we said, no, no, we don't need to be in between. You signed the contract directly with Alvalol. They're strong enough now. At the time they were not strong enough, of course, they, they preferred the Tui Care Foundation preferred to do it through us. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the partner is strong enough, you know why should we be there uh, to 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 be there? No, but it's great to see that both is possible. And Tui, yeah. of course, is, is another huge potential here in, in Mallorca. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. So so doing a lot exactly. here. In, uh, yeah. So that that would be another opportunity. But but Tui Care Foundation will not fund long term processes, mm -hmm. but they will fund projects. Mm -hmm. So so um, it just depends. You know, for instance, Bijland, the Dutch uh, Alvelal, you could say. They started um, in 2016 as a project, a common project, Netherlands, because the Dutch government wanted to do something. So we, we did the scouting, uh, we, we brought people on board, and, uh, and in 2019, they became independent. And, and also with their independency as a legal entity, all the, fund, all the funding uh, were going from our account uh, oh, let's say the contracts were moving from contract between Commonland and this and the funders mm -hmm. towards contracts directly with Weiland. Mm -hmm. But we still fund Weiland mm -hmm. as Commonland because to make sure that they can continue also when it goes wrong, when they, when they have no funders. Mm -hmm. And that means we need to make sure we get some extra funding from other sources to make sure we can do can keep up with this this process. Right. So so we we need to probably have another call separate to this conversation yeah, that's, yeah. to to discuss how we do the next um, steps um, and in order to have a couple of minutes to to talk about concrete next steps um, yeah. we probably and we do it with, with my colleague boss as well because i you know we have now a small group of people who they, they call it the nurture the, the the nursery where we nurture potential new projects that we can work on mm -hmm. and and see how we can continue with them and you're in that nursery yeah, I'm, I've already, we've already had a couple of conversations with Bas yeah. and, um, yeah. and uh, Tessa. Yeah. Tessa, maybe, or yeah. Jim. Yeah. 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 Great. So uh, thank you so much for this conversation. I, I want to ask a couple of questions after the, we stop the recording, but this, this has been wonderful. And I, I think that it will be really inspirational to a lot of people um, to to have been talked through this, both your, your journey um, and how, you, how it made you arrive at the four returns. And then... Uh, it's quite remarkable to see the the uptake and how it functions everywhere well in very different contexts or already and it and and it is putting simple concepts that ecologists or permaculturists would have would feel familiar with but it's putting it in into a language that um, a government official or uh, an investor or a business person can um, also understand, and, that, and I think that's hugely powerful. Um, along with the the, the long-term com commitment, that's uh, what 
unfortunately, so many projects don't understand that if you don't commit in the long term, you're wasting money because um, it. Yeah, it's uh, simply, yeah, thank you very much. It, it's, 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 as I said, it's, it's lovely to, to speak with you. And uh, yeah, um, I think maybe in, in summarizing the lessons uh, I've learned so far is that uh, if you really work with this kind of approaches or holistic approaches, the risks for investors as well as for governments will go down. And everyone, everyone wants to see risks go down, but um, it's so difficult to understand that this is actually a risk return thing we are doing. Um, but the returns are multiple and the risks are also multiple. But you know, working with two entities that are, bar, uh, uh, how do you say, dynamic, like ecology and people, um, you know, I think it's the most difficult uh, thing to do to work with these two di dynamic uh, uh, items or, or I don't know how you call it or entities. But, and, and but it's so challenging. It's and it's beautiful. And it, yeah. Ultimately, it's that this, this is this will be part of a new way of of thinking and working. They, this beautifully ties the, our conversation together because ultimately, this working with ecology and working with people, and if if we do it right from a holistic perspective that values science, but also holds that magic and that connection to landscape and place that we started mm -hmm. off with, um, yeah. then there's a healing of us learning to see that we are part of the ecology, um, which is the, 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 the big rift that runs through our culture is that too many people still think that there's the environment out there and there's human yeah. beings and culture and technology here. And to understand that that it's it's all one complex dynamic process nested from the local to the global is is really where we need to grow. Like that's the mature ration step of our species right now to make that yeah. Yeah. jump. And, and and also to because it gives us also a better understanding how we can benefit from technology mm -hmm. while not because technology can play a very important part in this, but it should not be the driver of processes. Exactly. Humans and ecology should be the driver. Exactly. That's often the uh, one, one thing that I uh, spend a lot of time thinking about lately is, is that we need to, on the one hand, have a very much deeper conversation about ethics and te technology and what technologies to use when and which technologies to maybe never use. Um, but at the same time, we also need to reposition technology as part of nature, as like it, to understand that, that if everything is natural to some extent, our cities and also our technology is part of this biophysical process. And, and some technologies can be adaptive and generate abundance and other technologies are maladaptive and will go extinct. So in, in that wider sense, we, we just have to pay attention to what technologies um, to use and, and to revalue the technologies of the natural world that, that do com complex regeneration work so much better than any um, human-made technology at this point uh, can do alone. So it's, it's bringing them together. Yeah. Wonderful. Now so we, 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 we could go, go, go on, but we'll, we'll stop now and have a, so we have a couple of minutes. Hold on.